Hi, everyone. First off, we at The Familiar Strange want to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we're recording this podcast and pay our respect to the elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, past and present. Let's go. Hello and welcome to The Familiar Strange. I am Ian Pollock, your familiar stranger today. Welcome to the podcast, brought to you with support from the Australian Anthropological Society and the Schools of Culture, History and Language and Archaeology and Anthropology at Australian National University and the Australian Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. Now, if I sound a little bit tired, uh, it's because I am really tired. We've uh, just had a baby in my house last couple of weeks. In fact, we launched this podcast when our baby was three weeks old. I know there's a lot of support literature out there for people trying to do a PhD and have a baby at the same time. I hope to someday have the time and attention span to read it. And if you have anything you want to add about how to know, parent and do a PhD at the same time, I hope you'll tweet at us at TFS Tweets or uh, contact us on thefamiliarstrange.com. Now on to my conversation with Asa Doron, who's an associate professor of anthropology here at ANU and a founding director of our South Asia Research Institute. He's an author or co-author of a couple of great books, including The Great Indian Phone Book and coming out next year, Waste of a Nation, Growth and Garbage in India. And what we really talk about today is how projects just lead onward and each one gives birth to the next one. So stories bring on new stories, networks tap into new networks, ideas lead on into ideas. So we get kind of a practical walkthrough of how this has gone through in his career. So for Asadaran, that means making the leap from traveler to researcher, getting to know poor boatmen on the Ganges, watching their lives get transformed by cheap new technology, following the technology onto the waste heap, following the waste heap back into the economy or into the rivers. Now, in this conversation, we look at giant infrastructures, telecoms, sewers, and at little things like shit. We talk a lot about shit, I'll be honest. So that's it. Hope you enjoy my conversation with Asadaran. So you were already interested in India before you left Israel? Yes. In Israel, there is a kind of rite of passage whereby after the army, many many people go traveling. And generally, you don't have a lot of money and you want to experience the world. And the two paths would be South America and the other would be Asia and India. I chose the India one. Uh, because I was reading about India quite a bit before and I was always attracted to the place. I actually read a spe- an interesting diary about India uh, from the 50s by one of the uh, most prominent journalists at the time. His name is Azriel Karlibach. And he wrote a, um, his travelogue about India in the 50s. Mm-hmm. It's been read by generations and generations since. And just directing all those generations of people, they... All these generations of Israelis sort of moving through India and Nepal and following in his footsteps? I would like to think so. (laughs) He was a very uh, cultured and learned person. And uh, many of of the people who went to India, it was very much a group mentality to go to India and Nepal, enjoy the lifestyle, what India could afford by way of cheap food, uh, beautiful scenery, uh, remarkable experiences, including uh, drugs and so on. So that's, that was part of the attraction of uh, Asia. I've heard a rumor, I don't know if you can confirm or deny this, but that the largest Seder in the world is held in Kathmandu every year. It was certainly the case uh, for many years. I don't know if it's still... but uh, so that, yeah. that's a real thing? Well, yeah, the, the thing is that so many Israelis travel to Asia that Chabad, which is an Orthodox Jewish organization, which is um, tries to kind of bring back the secular Jews into religion. It's, it's, it's the closest thing you ha- you, we have in Judaism to uh, apostatizing. Uh, well, actually, in New York, I'm used to seeing the Lubavitchers with the mitzvah mobile driving around. They've got a mitzvah tank. It's like a big RV, a camper van. And they stand around in the street asking people, are you Jewish? Are you Jewish? Just walk <laughs> exactly. by. So that's what they do in, in, in different places in Asia. And they have one in Bangkok, in Kathmandu, in several places in India. And especially for those kind of 
slightly disorientated, looking for themselves, post-army people. They want to bring you back to religion. It's also a very, a very comforting place to be in for these holidays. So yes, there is a big uh, seder. And then um, it's also, I, I think I attended, maybe I did attend, I can't remember now. It was so long back, but it's a very sterile food, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, unlike the Indian food. So people, people go to these places sometimes to recover and, and have some bland food. <laughs> So what's the what's the bland food where they have to, to schnitzels calm down? and uh, and mashed potatoes? Oh, so like real Ashkenazi food. Exactly. It must not be easy to find gefilte fish in India. I hope no. somebody's finding a way. No, but they might. <laughs> if anything, if Bring anyone can, it's Chabad. <laughs> they certainly can. Yeah. So it, it, there is something nice about it. There's something uh, nice about people uh, coming together. But there is also something quite distressing about the kind of mob mentality that Israelis used to have in the past, at least. Uh, I don't know how true it is now uh, when they traveled across India. And sometimes it was a very, very unpleasant to see because they could behave in ways that were quite bullish. So Really? Um, well, yeah, absolutely. And some restaurants in India at the time would bar Israelis from coming in or hotels because the, you come out of the army, you feel quite empowered, quite dominant. You've had some power over another population like the Palestinians. And uh, you've, you you kind of reproduce this colonial mentality in India and this this idea that you have, you're, you're somehow more privileged and more superior to the locals. And there were there was a concerted effort by various organizations, but even by the Israeli state, to try and tell these young ones after the army to um, to hold back and to uh, behave in more amicable ways because uh, it gave Israelis a bad name, full stop, uh, in India. Things now, I suspect, have changed because India constantly changes. Uh, in many in many places, are no longer colonized by Israelis. Now, for example, in Goa, there's uh, what used to be called the Italian beach and then Tel Aviv beach is now called is now uh, called the Russian beaches or the Moscow beach. So the Russians are coming in in droves to many of, of these coastal areas like uh, South India and Kerala, Varkala or Goa. Um, I found this in Bali too. When I was living in Bali, you know, in the, in the last 10 years. But there was a moment when suddenly the Russians started showing up. And all my Balinese friends, all the guides and things, they wanted to start learning Russian. Who can teach us Russian? Yeah, and go at least in many, many Russians. So where is the bulk of your field work done? Was it in Goa? No, no, actually. I mean, as I said, I was a traveler. I traveled quite extensively across India. And I even had a stint for several years as, um, as a tour guide in India. So I, oh, I managed really? to go to different places. Where were you based for that? Well, I was based in Israel. And then I was based in Australia. And it kind of got me through university. It was a good income, and it was a great way to to visit uh, the five star destinations mm. uh, in India and to learn a little bit more about a, a kind of tourism that I was uh, unfamiliar with as a traveler. So, were you already considering yourself an anthropologist at that point when you started guiding? Uh, no, not exactly. I was doing. I started when I was doing my BA. I did that for several years, even when I started doing my PhD. So yeah, there was a, there was a period when where I was kind of reflecting on it much more as as an anthropologist. But because I had friends who were doing anthropology, it was always in the back of my mind. This uh, these ideas. And how did you come to your PhD project? What was your PhD project? I came to my PhD project. And when I came to India, to Australia, and I, I was I was very fascinated by one of perhaps the most fascinating cities in India, at least from the perspective of pilgrims and uh, many of the British uh, predecessors that came to India. It's a city called Varanasi in the north, uh, north of India, and it's uh, one of the paramount centers for uh, Hindu religious practices and pilgrimage. It's, uh, some people have called it uh, the Axis Mundi uh, for Hindu religion. Architecturally, it's a beautiful city. It's called the Venice of the East sometimes, located on the river Ganga or Ganges. I was fascinated by the kind of uh, interactions that happen on the river, especially on, on that river front. And that's what I did my work on. I, I worked on, on the boat people who are at that junction between so-called tradition and modernity and how they translate the city 
to pilgrims, millions of pilgrims visiting that sacred space, to tourists, thousands and thousands of tourists go through that city. It's also called the city of death because there's people who are burnt on the riverfront. And how, they, how, how these boat people who have been there for generations kind of negotiate this, uh, these, these different stakeholders, including the state itself. So, so that was my, my work on the boatmen, and, and my office was on the river, as it were. So let's walk this back a little bit. The boatmen of the river. So you've got a big river, the River Ganga, flowing through the city. All along the shore, there are the temples where charnel grounds, where the bodies are being burned. Is that right? Not all. There's only the, there's, there's these lead, steps that lead down to the river. And only on particular ghats, two specifically ghats, uh, Manikarnika Ghat and Harishchandra Ghat, mm -hmm. uh, where these bodies are burned along the river. The other ghats, 80-odd ghats, or steps leading to the river, each one is, has its particular character and particular temples and different boatmen communities and different priests who are on the river officiating ceremonies. And it's, 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 it's got a very uh, long and distinguished history, this city. So that's, that's how, 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 if you can imagine it, that's how it looks. Mm -hmm. So you've got this incredibly vibrant life along the shore. And then you've got these men in boats, right? What do they do exactly? Well, they ply their trade. They take the boats from one gut, one landing scape to the other. These are little boats? How big are they? Um, when I came there, there were about 2,000 boats at the time, most of which were the boatmen were plying them manually. Uh, some were motor boats, and they're about, an, on an average, of five meters long. They can accommodate between five to 15 people. Then it was also the case in some in some on some guts uh, where you, the, you can have between 100 to 200 people in a boat. Oh wow, so that's a really big change. It's a big change. It's more profitable, and there's uh, there's an allowance for the motor boats so that the boatmen don't ply their trade as they did in the past so much physically, and uh, they're becoming uh, more prosperous. So these people who when I met them, many of whom were still on. Uh, you could say below the poverty line. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, many have prospered and they have big boats and have several boats. So let's talk method for a minute. How did you go about embedding yourself with these people? I did what most anthropologists would do, I think, is uh, just go there and, and sit for a while and observe. I did know about them before. I, I studied, uh, I read quite a bit of, about the ethnographies that preceded me. No one did that work before on the boatmen specifically, but Varanasi itself is quite a quite a bit of literature, especially from the religious perspective mm -hmm. of the city. And also the British themselves, the ethnographers during the British Raj, they produced a lot of material. So I've read that. And then when I came, I just sat on those steps, drank a lot of tea, and learned the language. What language was that? Hindi. Mm -hmm. And they, they also speak the local Bhojpuri or Banarasi Boli. Uh, but I studied mostly Hindi. Was that the language of your research generally? Yeah. And uh, after a few weeks, they see that you're not um, just another tourist and that you're there to uh, for the long haul. Then the people become interested in, in, in what you do and what your project is. And, and people like to tell their stories. I think that's what anthropologists usually find. And uh, so I stayed there for about an accumulated time of a year. Mm -hmm. And um, What kind of place did you live? Well, Varanasi is a place also where a lot of scholars visit, especially scholars studying Sanskrit. Native religious Indian scholars or scholars from abroad? From abroad. Come to study Sanskrit in Varanasi? Yeah. There's the Banaras Hindu University, which is there. And there are many pundits also who are very uh, well-versed in their religious literature. It depends. On different, on different stints, I stayed in different places. Uh, sometimes I stayed in um, guest houses along the river. But the majority of time, I, I stayed in a in a kind of guest house that accommodated different scholars from around the world who studied some. They were they were Japanese, they were Austrians, Americans, and it was fascinating because each of them were was studying a different uh, aspect of the city. It was great fun. It was also challenging uh, because each person has his own or her own ambitions and their own wants. And it was challenging because of the infrastructure. I mean, uh, a lot of power cuts, uh, water issues, and and so on. It wasn't uh, by any stretch of imagination a fancy place, but it was a very comfortable. And uh, um, unfortunately, it has shut down since. I think it was a, 
it ran for for many years before I came there. So your work in Varanasi turned into a book. And uh, what was your next project after that? Well, when I came back to Varanasi, after uh, I finished my dissertation and published the book, I realized that many of these people, these boatmen whom I lived with and knew for a long time were sporting this mobile phone. It became a hit in India. And that, that was really my next uh, project because it was just remarkable to see how people who are semi-literate, some of them even illiterate, were so uh, versed in everything mobile. Well, how quickly did this happen? Like just in the space of a year, a couple of years? A couple of years, yeah. And it took off unbelievably. I mean, in, in the span of 10 years, India became one of the leading places, mobile phones. It's Now it has over a billion mobile phones. Over a billion mobile phones. Oh, and man. this is the project that we wrote about me and my co-author, Robin Jeffrey, the, 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 the second book, The Great Indian Mobile Phone, where we tried to trace the impact, the social impact and economic and political impact of those mobile phones on the population. But I always gravitated back to Varanasi because it was where I had my network, where I spent most time, and learning about people who are generally marginalized populations and how they interact with this new technology was was really fascinating. I mean, you've just said a whole mouthful. There's so many different things to cover there. How do you even begin? Well, you'll have to read the book for that, but I can just give you a <laughs> teaser that... Uh, what I found most fascinating was uh, amongst the people that I work with, how they're introduced to a whole new understanding of, of, of consumption, of, of global consumerism. Where you have a mobile phone, which at the time were the branded ones, the, the, the most well-known ones were, were Nokia, Samsung, Sony. Those Nokia ones were great. I had one for years. It, I dropped it into like irrigation channels and it washed away and I found it and it still worked. Well, mine didn't, and that's what led me to uh, no. that's what led me to examine this whole repair economy in India, where people with limited purchasing power can't really go to these care centers that you have to adhere to certain protocols of warranty and guarantee, and you can't just tweak your mobile and work with it. Oh, okay, so, so, so this... buying buying that phone, you're actually stepping into a whole regime, right, of warranty. What did you call it? Warranties and guarantees. Yes. And, 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 and a lot of fine print, right? But not everybody has access to that. Exactly, and, and contracts and so forth. Yes. So uh, when your mobile breaks, you can't just go and do what we do in the in the so-called West is, is just the throwaway society, we upgrade it, we buy something new, and we put the mobile in the uh, in the drawer. They have there's all these people who who work on the streets and they tweak and massage and groom your mobile and and take uh, different parts and put it in in order to extend the life of those mobile phones, which I found quite fascinating. It's a real, it's a whole reclassification of of waste, isn't it? All these things that would otherwise be thrown away, but there are some people who can still see it as a resource. Exactly. And and that's in a way that's what led led us to our new project on waste, well, because we found um, that electronic waste was just bargaining in the end. Suddenly, all these mobile phones, after they've been used, they, they were even there. They even had afterlives. So let's walk through the life of the life of one of these cheap mobile phones, right? How does it begin? Well, first of all, it depends which mobile you bought. Uh, at the times, there were also what you were called were, were called the China mobiles, that were imitation phones that did feature old what the brand phone did, but for much uh, cheaper prices, but didn't have the kind of robustness that uh, that you would have liked from a regular one. Then you bought the mobile phone, and if it broke, you went to someone on the street who extended its life for however long and upgraded even the... So they just be like stalls on the street, like a guy on a stool, or what kind of Yeah, yeah, a guy on a stool or a hole in the wall, and you go there, and I did too, and they would upgrade your uh, software system, and they would put songs for you. You'd give them your uh, memory card. They'll put it in different in different folders. You'll have songs, Bollywood songs, screensavers of uh, worldwide wrestling, screensavers of gods and goddesses. Another one would have pornography in it. They'll all be neatly, uh, and you'd buy it for maybe 30 to 50 rupees per gigabyte. And then you could transfer it via Bluetooth or otherwise. So we're talking about poor people, like the, like still the river boatmen? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. River boatmen and others, yeah. In a lot of cases, is this the first time they've owned any media of their own? Absolutely. 
And it's also the first time that they had their own. So it's not like they had a cassette player before this. It's not like they had a CD player before this, is it? No, it's rare. I mean, uh, there there was very much a cassette culture, and especially in North India, and it's been written about. But the kind of proliferation, the widespread availability of mobile phones and what comes with it, all the media that comes with it, the songs, the uh, the ability to for bilateral communication between people, which was supervised previously. If we think about women, especially young women, for example, who suddenly have the ability to communicate with other people and males, especially without the supervision of their parents. So what kind of impacts did that have? Again, that's something that we wrote about. It had quite a, quite a remarkable impact. And in some cases, in extreme cases in India, uh, village councils banned women from having mobile phones. Wow. Because of the kind of risks and the threat that it posed to structures of authority. That would take, like, you really need some serious surveillance to enforce a thing like that, right? You do, but it's not... When you go back to the rural areas, it's not so difficult to uh, to survey, especially when people still lived in joint families. And privacy itself has been changing as a result of the introduction of this technology. Privacy itself has been changing? Well, the idea of privacy. So suddenly you have a mobile phone where you have to, um, where it's, a, it's a, your own private property that you keep with yourself, that you, you put a password on. That you're able, you want to communicate with people without the knowledge of others. So people had different mobiles for different purposes. Or two SIMs, three SIMs. Before these phones, were there any personal possessions that people had with them all the time like that? I don't think so. I think, but I think the same thing very much holds for us. Perhaps the the watch was a personal possession, but uh, I, I think there wasn't any any technology or anything that was so... Uh, disturbing to the social uh, economy and the social structures like the mobile phone. And this this is a threat. I mean, I, I, I interviewed, I remember, uh, upper caste women, especially whom when they, when they uh, married into a new family and had to move into it, they were asked to uh, leave their mobile phones behind. They were asked to leave their phones behind? Yeah. They wouldn't be allowed to bring a phone into the new family? No. It took several years until they established their authority or their status within the family for them to be able to have their own private mobile phone again. We, we were very interested also in the infrastructure. How do you lay out such a huge infrastructure to enable over a billion people? What, who, are, who, who are going to be the, we call them the missionaries of the mobiles, the people who would sell those mobiles to the millions who never had a phone before, who never accessed a phone? A landline was, was, was something rare in India. You had places where, where, where you would call, uh, uh, you would pay for three minutes. It was, uh, it was very rare for people to, to, to experience these, uh, these phones. So why, why should they take that up? So we try and, 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 and look at also these, uh, these issues. How do you educate a population in these new forms of consumption? And there's a slew of actors mm -hmm. that are involved, from the people who sell it to the people who try and in induct you to the uh, mobile phone world. To the, to the, what does that mean? Who inducts you to the mobile phone world? So, for example, there's all these youngsters that uh, went and did some training. And, and did training in hotels and learned through PowerPoint presentations in the metropolis and uh, came back to the uh, provinces, to these towns and, and rural areas and opened their shops and started explaining to the semi-literate and illiterate people what mobile phones can do. And does it start to be regarded as, I mean, this used to be a luxury. Does it start to be regarded as a real subsistence item? Do people depend on it? I think certainly this is the case. Yeah. So then does access to it become regarded as a right? I never heard of people regarded as a right in itself, let alone for women who are restricted. But it certainly enhanced... It's, it's a double-edged sword like any technology, right? It doesn't... Uh, I'll give you a, 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 perhaps one example. One of the boatmen that I knew for many years, his brother was uh, murdered. And once he found his brother hanging in, in the home, naked with only a 
loincloth uh, around his neck. Aye. The first thing he took is his Nokia out and he took photos of this because he needed evidence. The Nokia and the, the photos that he took with his Nokia 72 at the time provided evidence where he could take it to the police and demonstrate that this wasn't a suicide. It was actually a murder and he had a hunch who the people commit, that committed the murder they were a rival boatman family and so on and so forth. So, so by an unexpected route, maybe that technology gave that guy access to institutions that he wouldn't have had otherwise? Exactly. And it gave him some leverage. But having said that, he didn't have the capacity and the, the financial means to continue the court case to its logical end. And the other rival families did have that. And they also bribed the cops and the institutions. So... The case was dismissed in the end as a mere accident. So, I so mean, the technology, can... maybe it's necessary, but not sufficient, right? Exactly. It doesn't get you all the way there. There's too many other obstacles in the way. Exactly. And, and I mean, maybe if it was taken by the media, now with Twitter and, and Facebook, you have more options. I mean, the prol there's a proliferation in the air in, in, in how you can debate these things. And that's what the, the mobile, I think, uh, provided. But like you said, it wasn't sufficient. I'm wondering about, you said he took the dead man's phone to take the photograph? No, it was his, his own phone. Uh, I was just curious what happens to people's phones after they die, whether they're part of their personal effects in a serious way. Yeah, that's a good question. I've, uh, I have never uh, investigated this. Uh... Well, well, let's just move forward through the life of the phone then. So it's been bought. Somebody's been using it. What happens to it next? Once it breaks, usually it finds its way into these people who fix uh, mobile phones and they they use different parts to um, revive other mobile phones and extend their lives. And those that are completely uh, dead, um, I remember that's how I, that's how we got to this kind of the, the, the book that we're about to publish on waste because mm -hmm. uh, I, I was working in these uh, gray markets where, mob in, especially in Gafar Market in New Delhi, where mobile phones come to die or come to be reincarnated. I, I saw a person come in and take all these, uh, go around all the different stalls and take the dead mobile phones. And I was asking, where is it going to? And then tracing that to where, to those slums where it's pulverized and the precious metals taken away and the plastics and so on, and it's kind of uh, discombobulated <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> and deconstructed, that's what led, led us to think about the uh, electronic waste industry in India and more broadly about how to think, how India is redefining its relationship to waste. You call this e-waste, right? Electronic waste? Mm -hmm. Is most of it generated in India itself or is it coming from outside the country? Both. I mean, as I said, India has over a billion mobile phones, so there's certainly a lot coming, in, coming from India itself. But a lot of electronic waste is smuggled into India illegally from Western countries, including the U.S., Canada, Australia. It's very difficult to track and identify because different standards and protocols apply at different uh, countries and different legal measures. So there are laws against this. Does India have laws against it? Yes, absolutely. So these, these are um, very difficult to enforce and supervise, given that the majority of waste in India is being processed in the informal markets. So that's one of the issues that we were trying to tackle. What are the kind of hazards and toxic wastes that arrive to India? What kind of occupational hazards do these uh, waste pickers and traders experience? And we, we, look, we looked at different aspects of, of waste, not only electronic waste, which is a very clandestine activity, but other forms of waste from material waste, medical waste, uh, the, the, the common waste that we're used to, the glass, metals, plastics. Things we might in Australia or in America think of as the recyclables. Which we recycle in a very pious way in the <laughs> kind of yeah. redemptive activity of yeah, doing it every week. Yeah, about it. Yeah, and, and much of it ends up again on the shores of, of developing countries. Uh, another form of waste which is very distressing in India is, of course, liquid waste. The problems with sewage, problems with people relieving themselves in the open, openification it's mm -hmm. uh, known as. Uh, so we, we don't make distinctions between the liquid and, and the solid waste because we think they're, they're entwined, especially when you start thinking about infrastructure and the, uh, the municipal authorities and the kind of jurisdiction and the kind of capacities that these institutions have for processing waste. Let's just talk about the infrastructure for liquid waste. What are we talking about? Sewers? Well, sewage is huge, but it's, again, in the urban centers where sewage systems date back to the British period and... Uh, defunct and, and much of it ends up 
in the rivers, but there's also a lot of factory effluents that come from whether it's the tanneries in the north or the pharmaceutical industries manufacturers in the south that saturate bodies of waters with all these toxic materials. And um, just a lot of uh, dumping in these bodies of water. So, yeah, it's it's a very big problem. The Ganges River, is, is, as many people know, the sacred river is highly polluted. And the Indian government has been trying to somehow uh, deal with these, with these uh, types of pollutions for over 30 years now. When you're with the boatmen on the Varanasi, how do they talk about the quality of the water in the river? They're very much aware that the river is polluted. Again, here you come into that a blurry zone about a river that's considered ritually pure, but it is, in terms of the kind of everyday life of the river, it's very polluted. And so it's both pure and polluted at the same time? It is indeed. And and they they have terms to speak about these different types of pollution. But the pilgrims themselves would come and bathe in the river, even though they do know that it is polluted. But the ritual pur- purifications that one who arrives to the city of Varanasi or who bathes in the river are very powerful. But many of the boatmen now would resist bathing on daily basis in the river because they see the pollution. It's visible. The stench is there. What did, what do you say? It's visible. What do they see? Oh, the, the water is murky. A lot of times you see dead bodies and dead carcasses. The boatmen who know the river very well also know where the effluents come out of the city. The broken sewage lines that just flush all the sewage into the water. They're very well aware of this. So sewage, if we're talking about human waste, right? Yeah. That's something that uh, that you've shown an interest in in some of your writing, isn't it? Yeah, well, we wrote we wrote this uh, this piece, uh, uh, me and another colleague, Ira Raja, on the cultural politics of shit, and we tried to understand... The cultural politics of shit. Yes. And we tried to understand what's involved in the problem of opendification, where in India it's uh, that's over... Half a billion people still relieving themselves in the open. That's what open defecation means, just not into a toilet, just out yeah, out in the world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's all fine if um, you do it in certain climatic conditions and it dries up and you're, you're not in a very populated area. But um, it has a lot of dangers and prejudices associated with it. So um, that's what we try to... Um, to trace in that article, and especially looking at the gender dimension, where many women are forced to, op- to defecate in the open, and this this uh, renders them vulnerable to police harassment, to sexual harassment, and the kind of issues that they speak about when they go out to relieve themselves. It's a very uh, complex issue, but I think uh, something that um, in the book that Robin Jeffrey and I are, are about to publish, we try and put our finger on some of the main issues to do with trying to encourage people to uh, build toilets that are um, uh, suitable for the environment and the cultural and social issues that are involved. So coming back to method for a minute, is this something you have trouble getting people to talk about? In India, it's not a big... Uh, I don't. I, I never encountered uh, uh, resistance to talking about this. You okay. know, it starts even when we, if we come back full circle to when you're a traveler. Uh, the, I think the majority of travelers are in, in India... Uh, when they uh, meet each other, they discuss the bodily fluids that come out of their uh, <laughs> So they, their just, pores. they talk about what they ate and what made them sick and why they're recovering now with some gefilte fish. Uh, well, not only that, it gives you some road status. Uh, how, how how many times have you been sick in India? And uh, <laughs> how does it look? That and, seems uh, backwards. I think you'd have the status if you hadn't been sick at all. It'd show you have this, the iron stomach. Right. Yeah, that's, that's another point. But yeah, it's certainly... Um, Something that people are willing to discuss because there's many illnesses and there's, there's a lot of diarrheal diseases. People, many children die, of course. We ought to be before the age of five. The question of child stunting is something that's a huge concern in India because of open defecation. Now, this is uh, this is something that would afflict both uh, rich and poor. I mean, the flies that go from the feces into the water, into the food, don't look at your uh, bank account. But, but it certainly disproportionately more affects the marginalized and the poor. I was going to say, it sounds like this must be mostly a poor people's problem, but interesting that it could be connecting rich and poor through the medium of flies. It is It is something that we, we try and, and talk about, what we call in the book uh, the binding crisis. What are the binding crises that would generate enough political will and drive 
amongst a population that's polarized around caste, class, gender. So you're just looking for those cross-cutting ties that bind all those different groups together across all levels of status? If there are some, and we try and identify a, a few in, in terms of waste and waste management. and uh, Because uh, over the last 30 years, the amount of waste and the nature, I mean, the makeup of waste in India has changed enormously. And for a country of 1.2, over 1.2 billion people, the, how it's going to deal with this magnitude is going to shape its future. When you're writing about India, and as somebody, I, I write about Indonesia, it's also a very big country, but India is in a class by itself. Do you find that those issues of scale can just kind of overwhelm everything? Is it difficult to focus down on small places and small issues? Or does it always tend to scale all the way up to the 1.2 billion? I think the, the, the wonderful thing about working with a historian and a political scientist is that uh, Robin Jeffrey has that both comparative perspective, but also the, understand, the historical depth of understanding of scale, both temporally, but also spatially. And so as an anthropologist, I generally take the incursions on the ground and we combine an aerial view and the ethnographic or ethnographic perspective, at least, to try and bring together these two dimensions and, 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 the, and, and try and show the different levels or different scales that are involved in such a huge problem. So that's interesting. Working with a co-author who's not an anthropologist, I feel like it really brings a lot to the project. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable uh, experience. And that's why we decided to do a second book after the mobile phone book. Mm -hmm. Is it hard working with a co-author? I mean, you must have a good relationship. You're doing another book. So I'm just wondering what, what this experience is like, what the positive experience sounds like. Uh, for me, I can only speak of the positives, to be honest. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a learning experience. And it's a ping pong. It's like playing ping pong. You're constantly uh, batting around ideas and thoughts and chapters. Mm -hmm. And you're rewriting each other's chapters and, and thinking through how you want to present this that would be both appealing and authoritative at the same time. We we're we're especially we we're specifically pitching it as we did with the mobile phone book to the intelligent audience and and, and trying to to refrain from from academic jargon because we believe that these are important issues and that's a challenge in and of itself. But, yeah. Uh, so are you hoping to have a policy impact out of this book as well? I think I think uh, certainly this one this book is uh, far more will have a far more policy impact. I hope in terms of the way it tries to chart the different issues that uh, we see as pertinent to India's redefining or rethinking its relationship to waste. Is there a strategy in place? Are you trying to get this, get this information in front of the right people? Uh, I think the right people will read it. I mean, if, if to go back, go back to the mobile phone book, it did have an impact and it did have impact both in both uh, uh, policy and uh, media circles and other, other academic circles. Okay, so how did, how did the mobile phone book have an impact in policy circles? How did it get there? Well, it, was, it sold many, many books, and we had many, many people approach us and, uh, from the industry itself as mm -hmm. well. And, um, so you made something that was accessible enough. Yes. You got it into the hands of enough people who could understand what you had to say. We did, absolutely. And that was, that was the boon of that book. I mean, we, it was widely and very favorably received in India and, and outside of India. So we had the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and other, usually what anthropologists wouldn't, wouldn't expect their book to be reviewed in. These, we had that audience. It was accessible enough to have a receptive ear in that audience. And so we tried to replicate at least that accessibility. So I'm writing my thesis right now. I'm in part of a whole cohort of PhD students who are writing our theses right now. We're in a, a writing group. We pass our writing back and forth. Some of it is more accessible than others. It's something we all want, but we're not, none of us are completely sure how to get there. What advice would you have for anthropologists trying to make their writing more accessible? My advice was try and write it as a story. Use theory as a treasure trove to illuminate what you've learned in the field of what you've seen or the stories, the myths, the rituals, the everyday life that you encounter rather than let the theory dictate how you do so. Uh, I confess that it's, uh, anthropology has a tendency to be, um, it's both a positive 
and a negative, but I think it has a tendency in some circles to be marred by this uh, or restricted by the theoretical apparatus. And uh, I think making it more accessible is is one of the um, the goals that I've tried to uh, to put in front of myself. You've got your next book coming out, which is Waste of a Nation that's coming out next year, right? Any idea what your next project will be after that? Well, again, things flow from one to another. And, and this one, the, the project that... Um, the current project on waste also highlighted some of the, the critical issues of health, public health, and how sanitation, uh, open defecation create a lot of disease. And in India, there are problems with waste management in the south, especially where factories produce antibiotics and release it to the environment and the soil, yeah, all of which make for a perfect storm for the antimicrobial resistant drugs. And I think that's something I'd like to investigate further from an anthropological perspective about health-seeking behavior, uh, how uh, people view antibiotics and these antimicrobials and what they do about it when uh, they're afflicted by these infections. It's interesting. Just thinking about that question now, I can see several different anthropological approaches you could take that are not equally useful from a policy sense, right? You could look at it just from the from the public health perspective and how uh, how people live with sickness and how people use medicine and and pollution and things like that. Or you could talk about the kind of the forefront of human to non-human relations and the agency of microbes and uh, uh, the, the kind of non-human species anthropology. Uh, I could see a lot, of, a lot of scholars would probably take it in that direction. You don't see that for yourself, do you? I, I, I'm still in the beginning stages of, of working through this. I think like waste, like mobile phones, uh, it, it will, in, in the end, the, the ethnography or the, uh, the anthropological experiences will dictate where, where I, I think I take it. The ethnography is in the stories. Um, that's that's the things that at least draw me into these these issues. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you for uh, all your stories today, and uh, good luck on the book launch next year and with the next thing. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. That was it, me and Asa Doron. Today's episode was produced by me, Ian Pollock, with help from Jody Lee Tremboth, Simon Theobald, and Julia Brown. Our executive producer is me, Ian Pollock. Subscribe to the Familiar Strange podcast. You can find us on iTunes and all the other familiar places. Don't forget to leave us a rating or a review. Let us know what you liked, you didn't like. It helps people find the show, and it helps us make the show better. You can find the show notes, including a list of all the books and papers mentioned today, plus our blog about anthropology's role in the world at thefamiliarstrange.com. The latest post on the blog by guest blogger Justine Chambers is unpicking an amoral anthropological stance, ongoing violence in Myanmar, looking at the Rohingya crisis there. It is uh, a difficult issue. Do you isolate? Do you engage? What counts as conciliation? What can you do to try and make things better, even if it means alienating the informants or other people that you work with in that country? Justine has a really thoughtful take on it, and you can read it at thefamiliarstrange.com. If you want to contribute to the blog or have anything you want to say to me or the other hosts of this program, email us at submissions at thefamiliarstrange.com, tweet at TFS Tweets, or look us up on Facebook and Instagram. Music by Pete Dabro. There's a link to his EP in the show notes. Special thanks to Julia Miller, Will Grant, and Maud Rowe. Thanks for listening. See you in two weeks. And until next time, keep talking strange. <laughs>